Welcome to The High Bar, your weekly watering hole for lighthearted conversation with people who care about culture that matters. I'm Warren Etheridge, your host and barkeep. I promise never to cut anyone off and encourage us all to think responsibly. Today, we'll raise a toast and raise the bar for the great American novel. Sometimes it seems that the great American novel is as elusive as the great Seattle bagel, but that doesn't mean I don't keep looking for it. But today we have an author who's come damn close with his first published novel, Jonathan Evison, who's all about Lulu, won the Washington State Book Award just this past year. Welcome, Johnny. Thank you, and thanks <laughs> for having me be a guest on the uh, high bar, my friend. <laughs> oh, no problem. You like to drink and you like to talk. I do. That's a good combination mm -hmm. for us. Yep. But tell me, should we really be concentrating on the great American novel, or is this a pipe dream? Well, you know, uh, Warren, I, I guess it's probably kind of hard to argue that the novel hasn't uh, lost a little steam and a little social currency in the past, oh, five or six decades or ten. <laughs> um, but I, I kind of feel like the novel is more important than ever because it is the only thing that does slow down, because it's the only thing that does allow us to really reflect in a, in a culture where uh, images are coming at me at 220 a minute, and, and, and there's a constant stream of internet media uh, f fighting for my attention. Um, the book is this little world that can do things that uh, no other artistic medium can do. So when people tell me the novel is dying, I tell them, you know, well, I tell them something with my finger. <laughs> that's, a, that's a retort. Yeah. As a wordsmith, that's what you go to mm -hmm. as a gesture. That's, that's right. right. But isn't it possible that you're just being passed by, essentially? I mean, isn't that you evolution? Me personally or the rest of them? Well, you personally, but no, also the, the field no. in general. <laughs> uh, in what way? I mean, if, you, if we go to that David Shields thing about reality hunger and the fact that we're moving to these smaller snippets, what about that? Maybe the uh, novel is dead. Maybe the attention span is gone. If you let it be, I mean, I just think too many, too, too many people just want to glom on to technology for the sake of being technology without really uh, stopping to consider whether it's an improvement. I don't want to be constantly distracted. I don't want a constant stream of media. I find that uh, the discontinuity of the modern world is something I'd rather sort of uh, have some little respite from at some point. That's why I live in the woods, and that's why I read novels. Right. But you're an oddity that way. I mean, most people are not reading like that. Most people aren't. They're, they're, they're looking at their little iPhones or their Blackberries or they're playing on computers. They're not doing that. Yeah. Um, why, why? I think part of the problem with the, the, w w with the novel seizing a bigger piece of, say, the entertainment dollar or just the cultural consciousness is just the fact that the Academy has sort of marginalized the form. I mean, we're stuck in a college basement with elbow patches and, and <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the sort of intellectual elitism that... that, that requires that an instructor explain to me why something's good or uh, that celebrates the formality of language because nobody can tell a freaking story anymore. Um, I think this is hurting the novel as much as I think uh, the way the novel is published is hurting the novel, the fact that there's just too many titles being published. There's plenty of demand to sort out still, but when you're t there was a million titles published last year, a million books published last year. In 1990, there was 50,000, okay? So readership has probably gone up. The industry as a whole, because of this giant long tail backlist and all these titles, more books are being bought than ever, but fewer people are able to make a living. Fewer people are able to distinguish themselves because, meanwhile, the gatekeepers are going away. The newspapers are failing, you know? Um, there's just a whole bunch of cultural things conspiring to try to kill the novel, but, I mean... You know, I know a lot of passionate, amazing writers and I th that are doing things with the novel that have never been done. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess but the question... But with a million books being published, they must be getting published, right? Yeah, I think that figure is probably 50% uh, probably self-published. Um, but still, even the, even the big five, even the big corporate publishers are publishing something like 300,000 titles in a year. It's, there's probably <laughs> 3 million readers, so, you know, do the math. I mean... I heard a statistic that uh, blows people's minds about debut novels, that the average debut novel, I mean, be it from Simon & Schuster to, you know, uh, 
one of the POD publishers sells less than a thousand copies. Nobody knows that. Um, and that's good. A thousand copies would be good. A thousand <laughs> copies. Well, not good enough that you might have to. You might have to change your name to have right. somebody to publish your next book if you sell a thousand copies. Is that bad? If you don't sell four to seven thousand copies with a corporate publisher, it's going to be really hard to have somebody want to buy your next record. And yet, they continue to glut the market with all these titles instead of concentrating on marketing. I know when I published my first book when I was 16, it was a book about football trivia. I and have my, a copy. <laughs> you know, and, my, and my editor came to me and said, you just outsold America's leading poet. And, and he was excited. And yeah. I thought, this is the saddest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so I shouldn't be out, outselling Rod McEwen or whoever it was at the time. Yeah, well, what somebody <laughs> said about poetry is like between Shakespeare and Eliot was a bad time to be a poet. <laughs> it's, just, it's tough out there. You consider the poet, I mean, Again, it comes back to the academy. Like, uh, you could be Which one of the. Which academy are we talking about? We're not talking about the, Ampus here. We're talking about <laughs> the academy. The, academy. the big. No. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about uh, <laughs> universities and and, right. and and professors and and and, and the creating this literary canon, uh, mostly of dead white guys, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, <laughs> and dead white uh, guys. Yeah, and, yeah. and of course. Uh, and you haven't been drinking yet today. No, that's, that's the, the problem. Thing. That's, that's would the you problem. Like to crack yes, the beer? I would. Okay. <laughs> I'll just take a little sip of this. First. Oh, that's even better. Now, now. Oh, ask for a twist. <laughs> is this where I get the, Molly the on the phone? The twist is, <laughs> call your agent right now. <laughs> no, let's okay, let's sure. get cracking. Yeah, she wouldn't answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're an award-winning author, yeah. though. But now, but so more books being published. So there is more opportunity, but is this like the digital revolution? Everybody says, oh, like filmmakers now have so much more opportunities, but with more stuff out there, we're just glutting the market and nobody knows how to find it? I think there's better opportunities to find it now than ever. I think this is an economic issue. I think that the 20th century and the 19th century were about supply side economics, supply. We figured out supply pretty good. Right. The point with, <laughs> you know, I mean, getting a MP3, for instance, is yeah. not hard to do for free. Um, now it's about sorting out your demand, and I think that there's amazing social networks in place to do that. Things like Facebook and you know, well, MySpace maybe five years ago, or Twitter, or and and these are great tools because for the first time, you know, the entire playing field is leveled until somebody screws it up. I mean, there's literally 200 million people out there that I could reach out to, and if I do a good job of that, then um, I can build a readership, and that's what you have to do is build a readership, one reader at a time. But that's not a, a marketing, I mean, that's a marketing question. It's not a question about great writing. Is there great writing out there? Absolutely. I'm reading an amazing novel right now by a guy named Tom Ratchman. It's a debut called uh, The Imperfectionist, and it's about, it's basically just a big eulogic tome about the death of the newspaper industry, told from maybe 15 points of view, different mm -hmm. people that worked at the papers with one theme. And it's amazing. It, it, I, there's, there's, be, I think better writing going on now than there ever has been. I think really? I do. Well, really? yeah, I do. I think yeah. I, I, I read some amazing novels. Y you know, you have to remember that if you went back to the 1939 New York Times bestselling list, you're not going to find Faulkner, Hemingway, and Steinbeck on it. Right. You're going to find a bunch of ephemeral books you've never heard of. I do think that there's the robe thing. was top of the list. Really? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I don't it is. Trust me. I think I did that my research. <laughs> I think that you uh, referenced that before. I have. You have. Oh, shit. <laughs> I just swore, too. Um, I didn't hear it. I don't know where I was at, Warren. It's too early. I threw you off. Yeah. I th you started drinking too early. That's the problem. I encouraged it, and then you started drinking too early. Oh, yeah. I was just talking. I do think there's great things going on with the novel. I, th I do think that part of what happened is, uh, I think, again, there's a lot of writers coming out of MFA programs that are really writing beautiful sentences but not telling stories. And I'd like to see it. I'm already starting to see a shift by... Writers like Dennis Lehane, who would normally be considered in the past kind of a genre novelist, actually sort of crossing over into literary circles and getting his just rewards. Even a Stephen King, who was just laughable 10 years ago in terms of being a genre writer, people are actually taking him seriously. People are going, you know, maybe this guy isn't the greatest wordsmith, but this guy knows a thing or two about suspense or tension. Or, um, and I'm not trying to, I love to craft a beautiful sentence, but there's got to be more than that for me. A beautiful sentence serves a purpose. But to me, I think it's all about story. And I'm seeing more uh, novels that are story-centric versus, I mean, you know, modernism was, I guess, trying to make a point with, you know, th these are our lives. They're sort of static. Nothing happens. And, and it was kind of cool when Virginia Woolf did it and, and, and T.S. Eliot did it and 
James Joyce did, but that was a long time ago. And we've been kind of stuck in this, uh, uh, this modernist and realist route for so long that uh, I, I just feel like it's played out. I feel like it's time to get back to story. I mean, consider that the Academy didn't even really acknowledge Dickens until probably the 70s. You know what I mean? And now, now Dickens is generally considered, barring Shakespeare, the greatest writer in the English language. And people can argue that all they want, but it's going to be hard to find somebody more influential in the English language than Dickens, who changed the whole focus of the Victorian novel from the upper classes to, to the social problems and things on the street. And uh, so I think and we've, you're, you're bold we've enough seen this shift that I'm talking about before. You're bold enough to allude to both Dickens and Salinger in your first sentence. Yeah. I was trying to even the playing field a little bit because Salinger was kind of Salinger was kind of talking down. He, Salinger said his thing about I'm not going to give you the Copperfield no. crap. So I wanted to, you know, and he wasn't around to defend himself. So I wanted to <laughs> stick up for Charles as like my spiritual father. But from all reports, a real dickhead in real life. But there you go. Salinger or, or Dickens? Dickens. We know Salinger was a dickhead. <laughs> Dickens, it's hard to say. I saw an episode of Bonanza. Right. where he was complaining about plagiarism and people printing his stuff. He was a real jerk, so I feel like I know. <laughs> Maybe that's why he hid himself away. Maybe he was doing us all a favor. <laughs> but he, yeah. Well, look, I, I, Harper Lee demurred, and I think she did it quite gracefully. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Nobody hears from Harper Lee. I think right. that by being a cantankerous, I think it was sort of, Planned, don't you? But, I, I, but I, I have read you argue that maybe what literature needs, what the great American novel needs, is some bigger than life personalities, that we need a Hemingway again, that we need somebody bold. And I think that's definitely true. That I mean, even somebody as recently as Hunter S. Thompson, which isn't right. recent, but I mean, I think <clears throat> to have personalities that are bigger than life, to, to allow writers to get out of the college basement, to sort of uh, broach the mainstream a little bit, I mean, you know, the writing life is actually pretty damn sexy. You know, and it's better. Really? Yeah. Well, mine is. Dude, really? I sit, well, ah, you, sexy. You drink beer in a, in a Winnebago. Uh, a 70, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. Maybe that doesn't sound, to me, that's sexy because I have no schedule. I get to go out into the right. mountains and drink beer in a thing. I get to do whatever I want. Right. That's better than sitting. I mean, look, what's Brad Pitt doing? He's sitting in a trailer, except it's on a lot, and there's 30 people bugging him for autographs. I'm just out getting skunked with a bunch of white hairs, you know, <laughs> writing what I want. That's, uh, that's sexy to you. Ah, uh, gosh, I guess so. <laughs> I, 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 what, what does your wife think of that? What? Does she consider she's that sexy? She's there. No. Uh, does she that's think, where wow, I get all my work. I've, I've married into the sex appeal of the novelist. <laughs> Is that Boy, you're you really going to have to ask her that question because she married a novelist who had six unpublished novels, so <laughs> I don't know what she saw there. Uh, it wasn't so sexy when I was digging ditches. Um, no, I just mean that uh, there are writers out there with personality, and I'm definitely proving pretty convincingly that I'm not one of them here. But oh, no. I think it would help. I think it would help the general cause if if, if writers were more uh, had more social currency, were more a part of. I mean, there was a day when when there was a big news story, people went right to big novelists and asked them for you know nobody does that anymore. Right. People are going to ask you know Prez Hilton before they're at you know <laughs> before somebody's going to go knock on Philip Roth's cabin door. He had another sexy life, <laughs> another shut-in, <laughs> probably drinking all day, pumping it off. See, that's sexy to me. Yeah, man, I just want to be left him. alone, I guess. <laughs> Maybe sexy was the wrong word. But aren't you... <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Depressing <laughs> or pathetic. Maybe that... <laughs> no, I'm Maybe sorry. it's because I have Every... constant internet access while I'm sitting alone in that office <laughs> that the word sexy comes up. <laughs> But I mean, uh, this thing about like the bolder uh, characters, the bigger than life characters, or something, seems like you're reducing literature to the, you know, what we've done to pop music. Like, unless the woman is is attractive, she can't possibly sing. When there are plenty of people who actually can sing who just are homely. Yeah, and I'm not gone. saying that. I mean, do we I, really have to be brassy I, uh, and TV friendly to like write a great American novel? I don't know. Was Norman Mailer handsome? I don't know. No, but he was brassy. You want? He's you want yeah. oh. I don't. I mean, I, yeah. I don't mean no. I don't want to see it go that way. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I think it has. I think it is easier for writers who who are easier on the eyes and that can perform in social situations because touring is so much a part of the thing, right. and that's unfortunate. I mean, look. I mean, every writer, me included. I'm a social person. I would way rather just sit in my ivory tower, i.e., <laughs> 76 Winnebago, <laughs> getting skunked <laughs> and writing great American novels. But right. you know. I would starve in there. Right. I just can't do it. <laughs> I have to, to, to find readers one at a time. 